We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, and wherever you find your podcasts. Have you ever thought of getting therapy, but you're not certain if you really need it? And if you did, which would be the right form for you? Even the most cursory search of therapist websites brings up all sorts of puzzling jargon. There are several modes of therapy and many different schools of thought and ways of working. If you can pick your way through, how do you find someone who's a good fit for you? Fortunately, two of my previous witnesses on The Meaningful Life have written a book to answer all these questions. It's called A Straight Talking Introduction to Therapy, What It Is, Why It Works and How to Get It. The authors Matt Wooten and Graham Johnston, who are both psychotherapists and co-directors of the London Centre for Applied Psychotherapy, which offers ongoing personal development for therapists. So I'm going to ask the same question to both of you, but I'm going to start with Matt. What has been your own experience of trying to decide if you needed therapy and finding a therapist? So the journey for me began quite some time ago. I was in my early 20s and and I was really certain I needed some therapy. I needed some help. I had just broken up from a relationship which was very important to me and meaningful to me. And I'd messed that up with some pretty poor behaviours. And I think I wanted to understand a bit about why, where that came from, whether there was anything I could do about it. I bumped into a friend of mine and he was doing some training. He would have been doing something like a introduction to counselling course. And he said how excellent he thought the tutor who was providing the training to him was. And I reached out. But that tends to be how it goes in my experience. It's a bit serendipitous. You get lucky or you get unlucky. When I see people often, they've had much less positive experiences. They've bumped into somebody who maybe wasn't quite the right fit for them, wasn't offering therapy that kind of connected with their view of the world and was helpful. So I think I got lucky on that first occasion in particular. So we're going to try and get the luckiness out of this. Were you lucky too, Graham? I think I was lucky in the sense of there are similarities with my story to Matt's in that I went through a period of really quite deep depression in my late 20s, mid to late 20s, based on a a kind of streak of perfectionism and trying to live up to my own expectations of myself and really internalising a lot of those feelings and not talking to other people around me about them. And getting to the point where I think I pretty much broke, like I think I had a little bit of a mini, mini breakdown where I was able to continue life in terms of going to work every day. But I think my head was pretty messed up at that point. And I knew I needed to reach somewhere. I didn't know where to reach to. I wasn't interested in psychotherapy at that stage, had no idea what to look for. And fundamentally, went to go and see someone who was quite close by to me. I'm always in the mindset of thinking logistically, Andrew. So I was thinking, okay, I'm free on a Monday night. I've got a spare couple of hours. Who can I go and see on a Monday night at eight o'clock? And I found a guy and looking back, his way of working was, I imagine, quite unique in the sense of he shared a lot about himself and his life from session one. I saw him upstairs in a in a room in his loft in his London townhouse And I'd walk through the house and his teenage boys would be kind of coming in through the doors and out through the other doors. And I mean, it felt very private and very confidential, but it felt like I was being invited into someone's home and into someone's life in a way that made me feel safe. So I think I got really lucky to find someone who's relatively unique way of working. I'd say he was more from a kind of classic psychodynamic mindset, which meant he was interested in my personal history. He was interested in my relationships. He was interested in my unconscious. He was interested in dreams. And part of that left me cold, but a lot of it just connected to me on a deeply human level and helped me understand myself, my own story, and gave me tools and techniques to help improve myself. So yeah, I think fundamentally I got lucky. I could have ended up in someone's house around the corner from me who didn't know what they were doing and didn't help at all. So the first time I had therapy was after my partner died And I would say I got rather unlucky. 
at the beginning, I was lucky. I had a friend who'd also had therapy and he liked the organisation so much, he became the chairman or on the board of trustees or whatever. So, you know, I started really well, but unfortunately he retired right at a very crucial moment. So that was my first bit of bad luck. He recommended me to somebody else and it was not a fit. And I ended up, you know, doing a little bit like you did, going to the most convenient place, which was, you know, my doctor's surgery, which was five minutes round. That was a very nice guy, but he was not equipped to deal with the existential questions I wanted to ask, like, you know, is there life after death? It was sort of, how are you feeling today? Which sort of kept me stuck where I was. And I have to say, I found it not at all helpful. More recently, I'm sort of three and a half years into analysis, which we will explain about later. And that being a therapist, I know lots of other therapists and I asked another therapist for a recommendation. And so I had a bit of an inside track and I knew what I was wanting and I knew what I needed and I got what I wanted because I was a sort of informed consumer And I think that's what you're trying to do with this book, turn us all into informed consumers. Am I right about that? I think that's spot on. I think we we had someone like you in mind when we were writing the book. I think someone who knows that something's wrong, someone who might have had a not a particularly great experience maybe with a therapist or a counsellor in the past and thinks, well, I'm still interested in this. How do I make my way through this quite opaque industry, this industry that is quite difficult to understand, lots of terminology, lots of options? How do I make sense of that? And, you know, buying a book that probably you can dip in and out of and takes you know, half an hour, an hour to find the stuff that you really need, I think is a good investment of money and time to make sure you're finding the right person for you. Because it makes a big difference. If you find the right person for you, it can make a massive, massive difference to whether that therapy or that counselling is going to be genuinely helpful for you. Obviously, if you've just come through a bereavement or something, uh, you're having a breakdown, it's sort of screamingly obvious But in lots of cases, it's not so obvious. How do you know that the time is right? It's quite a tough question to answer, I think, that. I think if you're not convinced that there's a problem, honestly and candidly, I probably wouldn't come and waste your time. You know, you could drop in for a sample session, right? You could take a session and you could see whether you're going to find it useful. That, I think, is sensible, smart thing to do. But I wouldn't press on with something if you weren't convinced. So I get people sent to me, often young people sent by parents, and it seldom works out because the young person is not convinced they have a pressing problem. They don't particularly want to change the factors in their life. I sometimes get guys sent by their partners and they're not convinced they're doing anything wrong or that they need this or that therapy is terribly beneficial. So your job is not a salesman. No, definitely not. I think one of the core aspects of a good therapy is determining quite early on what it is you're there to do, what it is you're there to explore, what it is ideally you're there to change about yourself or about your life. And I think that's true whether you're seeking counselling, therapy, even coaching. Coaching is fundamentally about trying to achieve something, whereas therapy, I'd say, is more about kind of trying to understand and potentially change something about your life. And I think if your therapist isn't helping you in those first sessions to really get a a sense of what's going on in your life now that you want to change, why are you seeking help now? What can I help you to change in your life? Then you're at the risk of kind of coasting into that just weekly check-in kind of relationship that I think a lot of clients have with their therapist that, that can be genuinely helpful to a point, but can just go on forever. We're already getting lots of different titles thrown around. So let's start uh, defining terms. So there are different jobs. I'm going to say a job and one of you can tell me exactly what these people do. So let's start with the first one, psychiatrist. I'll have a go at that, Matt. (laughs) We're not psychiatrists, I think it's important to say, but I would say that a psychiatrist is a medically trained professional who is there to explore with you your case formulation and potentially give you a diagnosis, a medical diagnosis of what might be wrong with you in a kind of medical model. They'll then likely consider with you and prescribe medication for you. 
So psychiatric medication for you to take, whether that's anti-anxiety medication or antidepressant medication, for example, they might then do some talking therapy with you or refer you for talking therapy or group therapy if they think that's useful for you. But it's much more a kind of medical model and your mental health problem seen through that kind of medical lens where medication will routinely be the first port of call for treatment of that medical health problem. Yeah, the the only people in the mental health world who by and large can prescribe, right? That would be, I think, the key distinction. And most of them tend to do that rather than do talk therapy. So it'd be pretty unusual to go and do 50 minutes talking through an issue with a psychiatrist. You'd more likely do that with a psychologist, yeah. a therapist, some more terms for you, and you'd do a medication review. And they're the people who can often get you into some kind of mental health institution if, you know, we're in a terrible crisis sort of kind of situation. They're generally going to be plugged into the health service in wherever you're working and they will be able to lock, unlock doors that the rest of the people that we're talking about possibly can't. And it might be worth adding some context, Andrew, that for me and Matt are based in the UK and the main route for most people through to all of what we're talking about will be through their general practitioner, their GP. It might be available on the on the state health service. A lot of people, though, might want to choose to access some of these services privately and going to see a psychiatrist for the first time will cost you a lot more than going to see a counsellor, for example. So that's the psychiatrist, the first one. Then we've got your job title, psychotherapist. I think this is where it becomes a lot more grey, to be honest. And I think if you asked a sample of therapists, psychotherapists, counsellors, they would probably give you a slightly different answer on this as to whether those titles really are distinct or whether they all roll into one. I think it's helpful to talk about the distinctions because that's probably what we're doing here, aren't we? Most people, I think, would agree broadly that a counsellor, when we mean counsellor as distinct from psychotherapist, for example, is probably the kind of thing that you're talking about, Andrew, in terms of some of the therapy you're experiencing is somebody who is going to listen to you, ask you how you are, and then sit back and listen offering you empathy, offering you lots of opportunity to talk about the circumstances of your life, but probably less likely to intervene with tools and techniques. And this is often called person-centred. Explain that. Exactly right. So the way I would describe that is to say that it's all coming from you, the client. You know, I'm not going to try and influence that if I'm a counsellor. I'm literally holding the space for you to speak. So in some of those modes, you might just be invited to speak and you might speak the whole session. The person you're talking to might say relatively little in response to that. They might reflect back what you're saying. So they might say it sounds like you're talking about and then reflect that back to you. They might ask you questions about your feelings. What they'd be much less likely to do is pick up on something like a cognitive distortion, a bit more terminology for you. If they thought you were thinking about something in a way that wasn't accurate or helpful to you, they might just let that evolve and come out in due course. Whereas somebody who called themselves a psychotherapist and worked within a more cognitive behavioural tradition would probably immediately jump on a cognitive distortion and say, ah, I see something of what I think is going wrong here. Let's break this down. Let me show you something about this that might be helpful to you. We'll come back to what cognitive behavioural therapy is later. You can see how even when you're trying not to throw too many terms around, unfortunately, we professionals, we throw in all these terms. So a psychotherapist is going to be much more hands-on than a counsellor. Is that what you're saying? Potentially, potentially. I guess a lot of that will come from your preference as a client. So some therapists will be more akin to a counsellor and will allow you to fill most of that space and will occasionally offer some support and guidance and maybe some gentle challenge. Others, and I think it's fair to say me and Matt fit into this bundle of therapists a bit more, are a bit more proactive will stop you in the middle of a session and say, hang on a minute, let's slow down. Let's just examine what you've just said and think about whether that's likely to be accurate or I'm not sure that it's exactly how you describe it. Something along those lines. One of the things we want people to think about reading the book and coming out of this conversation is what sort of therapy might you want? Because if you're someone who wants someone to challenge them a little bit and proactively help them towards their objectives, their goals of therapy then that has an impact on whether that therapy is going to be useful for you. 
Let's move on to the next one, who is a psychoanalyst. Now, this is what I'm having. On his door, he says psychotherapist and psychoanalyst. So he does actually both, but I'm having the psychoanalysis. So what's the difference? Maybe you can tell us, Andrew, I'd be really interested to hear your experience of it because it's a type of therapy that lots of people don't get on with because they find it a bit remote. Again, you know, be be really interested to hear your experience of this because I think they come in slightly different shapes and flavours, but broadly a psychoanalyst is going to be looking for those unconscious connections in your mind. So lots of space for you to speak, for you to riff, if you like, for you to talk about whatever is on your mind. Nothing is too small or seemingly trivial, and they will be looking for connections that you can't see on a conscious level that are much more to do with how your unconscious mind is working. It's part of the reason for that lying down. It puts you in more of a dreamy, free-floating state. I'm not lying down. You're not lying down. More modern versions of psychoanalysis or psychoanalytically informed psychotherapy tend to have you seated, tend to have you coming maybe once or twice a week. Classic analysis would have been lying down on the chaise longue for five days a week. Not much of that going on outside of a bubble in North London and maybe parts of Manhattan, to be honest. And I think what we say in the book is where it's of value to you, great, terrific, right? But it's probably the least well researched of all of those forms of help and intervention. And I suspect won't be right for most people, partly because of the logistics, the time involved, the money involved, the expense involved. But for most people with most problems, talking about it in a roundabout way at length is probably not the most effective way of bringing some ease to your distress. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's so much aimed at easing a particular distress, although I've had plenty of distress. My father died during the process. So, you know, there's plenty to talk about. But I think that because I was trying to get greater self-knowledge, we need to sort of understand the difference between the unconscious and the conscious. So the conscious is what I use to navigate through the world and I'm using at the moment. And then the unconscious, sometimes described in Jungian terms as the self or the soul, is also actually very much in us, how we make decisions. It's almost like the unconscious will grab hold of the steering wheel. We think we're going along perfectly happily. We're in charge of our lives. And it grabs hold and drives us straight off the side of the road. So it's very good to understand that. And so most of the work is dream. So I take a generally take a dream each week. And that's what we talk about. Sometimes we'll talk about a, an issue that's around at the moment. And the interpretation of the dream is partly up to me, partly up to the analyst, mainly up to me. And it slowly builds a picture of yourself in a much deeper way than uh, I ever was aware of beforehand. It also gives you a sort of a lot of very useful images and ways of seeing how you are going through the world. So my parents were sports people. And so their way of seeing the world was entirely focused on, you know, the rules to follow. And if you follow the rules, you'll be a winner sort of kind of thing. And don't kick the ball out of the pitch kind of material. And, you know, that sort of kind of understanding of the way they approach the world and how I approach it entirely differently and where that mismatch was and what the impact of that mismatch was on me is the sort of thing that you find very slowly over a long period of time. But here they're looking at your unconscious. And when I ask a question like, where are we in our therapy? How's it going? The answer is, well, we'll just go where the unconscious wants to go. So it sort of feels unfocused. Whereas with your psychotherapist, and I I describe myself as a marital therapist, you know, if you want to say, where are we? Where are we going? What's the plan? I will discuss it with you. I assume that if you get asked, where are you going and what are we doing? You're perfectly happy to answer those questions. Yeah, I I think we'd probably go a bit further and say for most of our clients and most of the work that we're doing, we're probably trying to head towards something, right? We've probably established a goal, that question of motivation that we were talking about at the start, why do you want to be here? What is it you're motivated to change? What would you like that chance to look like? I think are all quite important questions for most people in therapy. For most people, a lot of time and money involved in this, and they want 
something as practical as possible as the outcome. So it doesn't suit that type of psychoanalytic intervention your, your, or psychoanalytic model you're talking about. But for most people, I think they've got an eye on where do I want to get to. So I think that broader question of what do you want from this is the really crucial one. What you want is to explore some things in your now, Andrew, but for somebody having a panic attack or suffering from obsessive compulsive thoughts, psychoanalysis would be of no use whatsoever, and nor would person-centered counseling. What you need is a series of interventions that are specific and tailored to that particular thing. Similarly, it would be very little use, I think, in the early stages of grief to be given techniques to think about how your mind is working and any cognitive distortions. You're full of grief. You're flooded with emotions. Some of that just needs to come out and get said. How much that person mattered to you, how desperately you miss them needs to be articulated. You don't need somebody challenging you on that. But as that work went on, if you were still struggling with those things, after a considerable length of time, then there might be a case for saying, actually, let's stop and think about this. Let's think about how we're approaching this. Is this ordinary grief or does it look like something else? And then we've got coach, which is possibly the complete opposite of an analyst. Yeah, I think of the work of a coach as being very if an analyst is looking very much at the unconscious, the coach's role is almost 100% in the world of the conscious mind, I think. What, what, what are you working towards? Is there a specific, often business-related aim that you want to work towards? A coach is going to be thinking with you how practically you can get there. So they'll be much more guiding and offering proactive advice in every throughout every single session. They'll probably give you homework to do, whether it's conversations you need to have or specific work-related tasks that you should do to move towards your goal. It's at the very opposite end of the spectrum from that more free-flowing, unconscious-focused psychoanalytic model. Matt, have you got anything to add with coaching? You, you, you do a lot of work with coaches. Yeah, I think there's an enormous amount of crossover, personally, between therapy and coaching. They are distinct. I mean, I, I think if you're dealing with something like the kind of problems I was talking about previously, obsessive-compulsive thoughts or behaviours or something like addiction, I wouldn't go anywhere near a coach for that. That doesn't make any sense to me. But I think lots of ordinary problems in life how you deal with relationships at work and at home. There's a huge crossover in terms of a really well-trained coach who knows what they're on about and the kind of help you would get from a therapist is going to look broadly similar. For lots of guys, I think the coaching, so I describe myself as a coach and a therapist or psychotherapist. I call myself a counsellor on some days as well because that's what people do, particularly like couples counselling tends to be couples counselling rather than couples therapy. But lots of guys find the idea of coaching just a bit more ordinary, a bit of an easier gateway to come through, I think, rather than therapy. And psychotherapy sounds a bit off-putting, I think, for a lot of people. Coaching, getting a bit of help. Well, everyone gets a coach. You know, Djokovic has a coach. He's brilliant at tennis, right? You know, but he's got a coach because he wants to stay brilliant and become even more brilliant. You know, that's something really ordinary about coaching that I think just sometimes helps. And I think if you want somebody hyper-focused, a coach is possibly going to be very useful. So if you want to deal with sobriety, a sobriety coach who's actually spending most of their time dealing with people who are having exactly the same problems, have most probably walked the same path as well, is going to be much better than a general psychotherapist who possibly doesn't work so much in that field. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I was just going to say, I mean, that's, I guess, it probably segues somewhere else in the conversation, but I think there is something really important to say about that. It's not just that a particular therapist or coach will be better than somebody else. There is something about you know, really knowing a subject area. So for something like OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, it's a very specific treatment protocol that tends to work best for that. And Graham and I know that protocol, and I've certainly used that with clients who've wanted to stay with me when that's come up rather than go somewhere else. But I would honestly always refer somebody to somebody else. There are a couple of people in the UK who I think are particularly outstanding in the area who've written on it, who do nothing but that. If I saw a young person with that kind of problem, that's where I would encourage them and their parents to go first. So then we've got different modes of therapy. Mm. So I'm just going to throw them all out at you in one go and <laughs> let's try and we've got individual, we've got couple, and sometimes, you know, I'm there helping a couple decide is this individual work or is it couple work? Family therapy, group therapy, and then the sort of subdivisions like sort of art and drama therapy. 
So off you go. See if you can unravel this one for us. Well, they kind of do what they say on the tin, don't they, in terms of the number of people that they're involving. And as you say, Andrew, I think the key starting point is where is the work focused? So with a couple, as you say, you might spend quite some time trying to help that couple identify what are the potentially damaging dynamics in their relationship. And it might be that one person within that couple has a specific trauma related history or substance abuse that they might need individual help with. And when one person needs therapy and a couple generally both need it because, you know, one might have trauma, the other one might have codependency, for example. They've just they're just showing up the problem in a different way from their background. So I really don't want to get the idea that one person is labelled as the problem. No, absolutely. One of the key things I do in couples work is to make sure that both parties know that it's their responsibility to try and change the dynamics of the relationship to make sure that that relationship works. It's never one person's responsibility or fault within that relationship. And as you say, it's highly likely that the dynamics that are created in that relationship are due to factors that both individuals might need to work on in individual therapy. Matt does a bit more kind of family related work than I do. Matt, do you want to take kind of family therapy and talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, again, I think it, it is is exactly what it says on the tin. It's as many members of the family who are willing to turn up, right? Sometimes members of the family won't come, right? But you, you could still have a session with the members of the family who are there. Ideally, you've got everybody in the room and you're beginning to try to generate an understanding that everybody's got a stake in this. But it isn't one particular person's problem. And I think that's the bit that can be difficult about it, because in some ways it's easier to define it that way. Like you've got a difficult teenager or you've got an errant someone who's doing something wrong in the family and that causes all the problems. It's seldom the case. It's the most interesting and fulfilling work when it goes well. I think family therapy, it's the most frustrating and difficult thing to do, I think, in other circumstances, because you've got to get so many different people and interests aligned and probably got to go for very pragmatic solutions. It's not what you want. It's what's best for that group. And that gets you into a more complex dynamic, I think. Now, when we come to group therapy, it can be on a particular topic. So everybody in the group is suffering or dealing with the same issue or generally different people are dealing with different issues. They're not related to each other. In fact, Often the therapists go to great lengths to make certain that nobody knows each other in the the group. So why would you do group therapy as opposed to individual therapy? I think one of the really major benefits of group therapy is a couple of things really on my mind. One, One is the sense of secrecy, confidentiality and safety that that brings to allow you to then talk about and share some deeply personal and potentially shame inducing or anxiety inducing issues about yourself. But I think the biggest thing for an individual to potentially get from group therapy is that understanding of how they are perceived by other people and how other people in reality actually respond to them. Because you're far more likely in a group therapy setting to get an honest and potentially really quite direct line of feedback about who you are, the impact you're having on them, and then potentially to work through, okay, what does that mean for me? If this group of people are experiencing me in this way, they might experience me as aggressive or hostile or passive or whatever it might be, that forces you to some degree to think differently about yourself and think about that difference between your self-image and how the group perceives you and then a line of work to do on yourself to potentially change some of those aspects about yourself so that people experience you in a different way. And that can help with relationships far outside that group, of course. That can help with relationships with your spouse, with family, with with friends, and improve your life in all sorts of ongoing knock-on ways. Another advantage of the group work is that when somebody else is talking about their problems, you can either suddenly think, oh, I've got other material myself that's just like that, or you can see their material much clearer than your own. And then you suddenly realise, oh, yes, and I've got that too. So it allows you to be a good listener, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Showing up for other people, aren't you? I do groups in prisons, uh, it's an area of work I know quite well from the first part of my career. And the kind of AA model, probably biggest you know, self-help group in the world, is exactly that. You don't want to go to a meeting, you go to a meeting anyway, because you're there for other people. It's not about you. It kind of spins it as well. You're there to listen, support, be 
witness to other people's struggle as well. Therapy, I think at its worst, can feel indulgent. It can feel like you get the houses on your problem, describing ad infinitum, the soap opera in your mind, the group therapy, you're also there for others. You're giving them a hug, metaphorically or literally, you're there for them, not just for you. And that's a key part of life too, right? It's not all about us. We're not the main character, it turns out. So let's go through very quickly some of the terms that you see on therapists' websites. We've got psychodynamic, systemic, humanist, and intricative. So I think we've covered psychodynamic, which is how our childhood impacts on us today. Systemic. Probably links in my mind to family therapy. So you're thinking about the system as a whole. You're not necessarily thinking about any one person with a problem or dynamic between two people. It is the wider system and the kind of interactions cross over one another are multiple. And often that's type of therapeutic intervention that might be used in business as well. You're trying to think about the whole of the thing. And you might also be going for more modest, I would say more modest solutions. You know, politics is sort of defined by the art of the possible rather than the best particular solution for you. If you're coming in and doing that type of therapy, you've probably got to have an open mind about what works for the system rather than what you personally want to get out of it. I mean, my comment on all of these things is if they're done well, they're sort of all the same, right? You know, good therapy is good therapy and they're not as distinct as I think sometimes people would make to be. I think it's really unwise to advertise yourself in those terms because nobody knows what the bloody hell you're t- about, you know, actually, you just want somebody who's going to tune into your problem, work with you to understand what you want. If Andrew wants to take up time and think about early childhood influences and his unconscious mind and how it influences daily life, then great, let's do that. But if Graham's got a problem around compulsive thinking and constant checking of the door and windows at night, then we've got a different thing on the table. So I think s- sometimes those terms can be really hard to understand. I would, in that instance, what we say in the book is try and get into a conversation with that yeah, person. Exactly. What, what does it mean yeah. to them? If somebody's yeah. advertising themselves in that particular way, what does it mean if they're calling themselves a counsellor or they're being very distinct about how they're describing what it is they do? That's probably where I'd go on this. Like, let's have a conversation and let me see whether this person gets me and gets my problem. I'd agree strongly with that. I don't describe myself as an integrative therapist, but I think of myself as one in the sense of I'm integrating aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. I wouldn't explain it in that way to a client unless they were interested. I'd explain it more in terms of why we're doing what we're doing, but I don't think it's necessarily meaningful to someone looking at my website. I doubt they're asking, is this guy an integrative or a humanistic or a systemic therapist? They're just thinking, is this someone who seems like he's going to be able to help me? Yeah, the problem is that people often have a section of their website called How Do I Work? And they have all these terms in there and you sort of want to know how they work. I mean, this is one I don't understand myself, so you're going to have to help me. What's a humanist (laughs) therapist? For me, the humanist approach would be broadly what we were talking about in terms of the person-centred therapy. So somebody very focused on you as an individual, that you've got it in you, you know, that you are the acorn, it will grow, it will blossom. All you need are the right conditions for that to be. You don't need an intervention. We're not trying to solve a problem. We're trying to help you flourish as a human being. And obviously there's something lovely and wonderful about that. And that's right for everyone all the time, but it's maybe not the right approach when you're having a panic attack on the London underground and you want to fix on that particular thing. So cognitive behavioral therapy, sometimes called CBT. Yep. Two big words in that, the C and the B. So the C is the cognitive, which is examining the way that you think fundamentally, having a look at some of those core beliefs, which might be conscious, might be unconscious core beliefs about the way you see the world and see yourself and trying to make sure that you're not falling prey to any of those cognitive distortions or cognitive errors that Matt was talking about. So things that We as humans have a tendency to focus on the negative. We have a tendency to downplay our own abilities, et cetera, et cetera. And a CBT therapist with the cognitive part of that therapy will be helping you to understand what sort of core beliefs you might want to challenge within yourself and give you some support in exactly how to do that. The B element of it is the behavior, which is... Does what, again, does what it says on the tin, encouraging you to behave differently in the world to change how you think and feel. So if you're suffering from anxiety, for example, so take low level social anxiety, they might help you 
think about ways you can practice between sessions, putting yourself in uncomfortable and increasingly uncomfortable social situations to prove to yourself over time that you can deal with it and that you can achieve more than maybe those thoughts are telling you you can achieve. So how do you find a therapist then? So I think the most people will be looking at either a search directory, so something like counselling directory, or they'll go through an accreditation body search directory, or they'll just Google something, right? And what I would advise people to do to try and find a good therapist for them is to ask themselves a couple of kind of core questions to begin with. One is, what do I think might be going on for myself at the moment? Am I suffering from anxiety? Am I suffering from depression and sadness? Am I suffering from obsessive compulsive behaviours? Because that's going to drive what sort of clinician you might want to go and see. The second question I'd ask people to ask themselves before they choose the therapist is what are my preferences? Am I someone who wants someone to challenge me, wants to do work between sessions? Am I someone who is going to put the time and effort in between sessions to push forward my goals, right? Those two things might help shape the type of person you're looking for. But then I would really encourage people to shop around. I'd encourage people to have intro sessions with therapists. I'd encourage people to ask a lot of questions of their therapists. You know, what do you think is going to be helpful for me? What's your experience with my type of problem? How do you think you are going to help me? And unless you're convinced by answers to those questions, I'd suggest you continue to shop around. And therapists don't like it when you ask them about their training and what they do. I, I must admit, I find it uncomfortable when I ask my uh, analysts these questions. That you could you could sense the uncomfortableness. Why is that? I honestly don't know why that is, Andrew, but I completely share your sense of that. I think therapists are really opaque about their prices as well. It drives me absolutely nuts that nobody says what they charge. There's almost no other service in the world where you've got to guess the price. Uh, and that seems to me to be unhelpful for the majority of people who would like to know what the service is being billed at. They've got a budget in mind. They've got some money left over at the end of the month and it is a finite amount it doesn't stretch you know it's an important detail so i would try and be open about those things when people come to my home i've got two young boys you can see their football boots outside and their school shoes and bits and pieces as you look down the hallway i'm not trying to hide that i don't think those things matter as much as therapists think they matter. I think you can be really open about the way you work. And you can even say to a client, you probably don't need to worry about that too much. Let's get going. Let's talk. You tell me about your problem. You'll see how I work. You'll see whether I feel like the kind of person who gets you and can help. That's probably where I'd place the emphasis. Yeah, because the thing that is really at the core of it is, can you form a good relationship with this person? Sure. And yeah. that's really difficult because you can't tell that from a website. No. No, I think there is an element of suck it and see, isn't there? You've got to get involved. And what's what's it like to open up to that person? You know, they got like funny tics and mannerisms that you just can't put up with. You know, do they feel human? Are they taking it all very seriously? Is that what you want? Do you want them to have a little bit of levity? Do you want them to disclose a bit about their life or does that really put you off? And I, I don't think I'm the right therapist for everybody. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. really convinced of that. It depends. And I think that connection is crucial. You know, I would do everything you can. You can get, I think, a bit of a feel and a flavor from the website. You can get a bit more from a phone call. You can only really get it, I think, from the first session you have. And even then, I think you don't actually know whether they're going to be able to help you. You know whether you think they're all right and they get you a bit, but whether they're actually going to be able to help think does come a bit further down the line. So there is an element of get stuck in. If they're good enough, I'd stick with it. I don't think yep. your therapist has to be perfect, but if they're really not quite connecting with you or you're not connecting with them, I would cut your losses. You know, even if you've spent a couple of hundred quid on the first couple of sessions, if it's not working, I would draw a line and move on. Okay. Well, we're going to, uh, in the bonus material, look about what to do if you're blocked in your therapy. Because sometimes the problem is that actually they're the very much the person you want or you need because the reason you're having problems with them is because they're exactly like your father and that yeah. is, is the thing that you need to work on. So sometimes, you know, those can be, you know, when is that good and when is that is, is it a disaster? But we'll talk more about that in detail in the bonus material. But next we're going to be looking at a letter uh, that's been sent in and we can sort of see a little bit of therapy in action, so to speak. 
The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So if you'd like to participate in the program, go to my website, andrewgmarshall.com and go to the participate in the program section. I've been looking at my family dynamics of codependency and boundary crossing, especially in the last year since my wife and I moved back home to be closer to family. Over the years, I've realised I was sort of playing a role in life, projecting an image of having it all figured out and staying on a certain path of success. Inside, I felt a lot of turmoil and unexpressed fears. My brother is an outwardly anxious and depressive type of personality. He's a lovely guy, but in our family, I felt he could express whatever he needed to and my parents would appease him. I didn't feel I got the same allowance. I became a type of balm for my brother, being told to reassure him or avoiding certain things so not to upset him. As adults, my brother and I have a good relationship. But recently, after a difficult chat, my father called me up in a huff and said I'd made my brother feel like crap. I felt completely blindsided and angry, sad, disappointed amongst other things. I told my dad that the talk was between me and my brother and that we could work it out if need be. Dad said he felt compelled to call and say something. I feel like I go back to being a scared child when these sorts of experiences happen. I'm proud to say I stood up for myself and expressed that I felt a boundary was crossed. My parents' immediate response is lots of justifications. I feel so triggered and helpless with my family sometimes. I love them, but I'm afraid we won't grow closer and these sort of challenges will continue for a long time. I have a partner who can relate to these feelings with her family and she's been so supportive and understanding about everything I'm going through. I go to a counsellor who's been good too, but it's limited lately. I want to be able to sustain myself, parent myself, I guess, in ways my parents weren't able to, stay healthy with the relationship with myself, my partner and my family. I'm feeling raw at the moment, so I needed to reach out. One of the the main things that jumped out to me listening to the, the letter was how many positive foundations there are already for this person. A lot of self awareness, both of their thinking and how they feel. It sounds like someone who's done quite a lot of internal work, either with a therapist or with themselves and and with their counsellor over the years to really understand their their own responses. So so a lot of foundations to work from here, right? And I think they're right to be proud of themselves for standing up with the boundary with their dad. They appreciate, like all of us have had, that they had a role in their childhood that they might have put themselves in or were expected to occupy. They understand that and are trying to challenge that in what I would suggest are quite healthy ways. Now, it sounds like there's room to manoeuvre in the relationship with the brother in terms of drawing closer to him and being more honest with him. There was something in the letter that made me think about the acceptance part of acceptance and commitment therapy, that within the family context, there's a possibility that the parents might respond well to this individual, challenging them a bit more, standing up for their own boundaries. But of course, there's a possibility that they won't. And although there's a hope with in the letter that the family grow closer, there might have to be some acceptance along the line for this person that with some of those relationships within the family, they might not feel closer as their parents get older. And there there might be some tough grief work, some tough acceptance work there about what the relationships with the mum and the dad might be. And if that is the case, I'd urge them to kind of look for some solidarity with that rawness that they feel in other aspects of their life, the relationship with their partner, for example, and other aspects of their life where they might be able to feel themselves, feel confident, thrive and grow in their life and feel soothed in a way that maybe might not be possible in the relationship with the parents. Matt? Graham and I didn't talk about this before we came on, and I feel very similarly about this. I think there's so much to admire about where the listener is with the problem, that kind of insight that they've got into their own life and the life of the people around him, that ability to recognize that the brother has taken up a lot of space, space that the listener might have wanted, but also recognizing that he's a lovely guy. It's quite a sophisticated thing to be able to hold those two things 
together. So th- there's so much to admire in this. He knows that dad's overstepping and he's been able to say to dad, I think you're overstepping. Where I'd agree with Graham again is dad is allowed to have feelings. Like dad is dad, right? So he was phoned up in a huff. Well, big surprise. Dad's got strong feelings about how the two boys get on. I think where the therapy I would guess has been helpful is in taking an empathetic stance towards what the listener has been experiencing in the family, where I think it might be, I mean, I'm speculating here, aren't I? But where I think it might be less helpful is there might be some challenge around acceptance. Let's be realistic about this. I'd be a realistic optimist. I'd have a go at asking dad to do something differently. I'd have a go at talking to the brother about what the listener wants from that relationship, i.e. maybe don't go to dad on these things. Come to me, we can talk this through. But I'd also be realistic about it. Is dad, I I know how old dad is, but let's say, you know, is he really changing after six or seven decades of doing things in the way he's always done it? I don't know. I don't think that thing is on the table for the listener. What's on the table is can he adopt a, a realistic stance towards this? Can he be a bit disappointed with dad's reaction, but still see the good in dad? Can he find his brother a pain in the ass sometimes and also love the bones of him? And, and that might have to be good enough. Some of the challenge of therapy might be, can we put those things together and call that a seven out of 10, you know, trying to get to nine and a half, 10 out of 10, trying to perfect that family and its constituent parts over which you have really relatively little influence, I think is probably a fool's errand. And the problem is once we discover boundaries, you know, we discover how wonderful they are, we want everybody else to know this information. Mm. And family don't like boundaries. They've not had boundaries. They're not going to like them. But that doesn't mean you have to give up. The message probably is getting through slowly but surely. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I th- yeah, I think that's really important, Andrew, that, it, that it, sometimes those things just need repeating again and again. If you think about any process of learning, it's repetition, isn't it? So if he said once, look, dad, you're overstepping and then dad continues to overstep. Well, the challenge in therapy is you need to go back and repeat that request, right? You need to explain why it's important to you and you need to be dogged and resilient. I think there's something probably in the therapy around that. Okay, it didn't work this week. Go back and do it again. Dad put the phone down on you yesterday when you tried to raise it, you know, be brave, deep breath, go again, those kinds of things. And also, kind of expectation that dad might also call you up. Sorry, I put the phone down in the week. You know, that kind of, I think that it can move. I think sometimes people have said it once, they've tried to land the point once and then, I don't know, not too much giving up, digging in, really working hard on those things. Yeah, I sometimes talk of dog training for parents, which Mm, is reward the stuff that you like. So, you know, when they keep their nose out, you know, you're you're really warm and friendly and, you know, everything's wonderful. And when they stick their noses in, you just turn away. You know, I've told you this before, my brother and I will sort this out ourselves. So can we leave the conversation there? You know, so you're not scolding the dog, you're just being firm. And when he resists the temptation, and when he does what you want, you say, thank you, dad, I really love you. That's really wonderful. You know, the yeah. equivalent of giving them uh, little dog treats. So reward the stuff you like. Don't expect them to like the boundaries. Yeah. Different kind of analogy would be gym, maybe, you know. So if you don't go for a bit, like if you don't have those conversations, if things are okay for a while and you go back to the gym, you would have lost some of your fitness. Like dad needs a reminder. You need to step back into this. It will be hard every time. If things are peaceable for a while and then flare up, like you need to keep at it, right? There is something about just being, yeah, resilient, I guess, dogged on those things where they're important to you. It's okay to ask. You're going to need to keep asking. And that doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to get it. It may be that you're dealing with a really flawed dad who's got some terrific attributes and also some deficits and blind spots and bits where he just doesn't see the dynamic. You know, that might be workable too. So I have to say, as we're coming towards the end of the main programme, I've already had you on the show beforehand, interestingly enough, talking about boundaries. So go back and find that episode because I think you'll enjoy it. So instead of asking what makes your life meaningful, I'm going to ask what have you done recently that's meaningful? So let's have Graham first. Since we last spoke, Andrew, I think we just moved as a family to Norfolk. And I think what I have really tried to work on in the last 18 months, two years since we last spoke is really immersing myself in the local community and trying to expand that part of my life that is not just about me, that's in service for others. And I'm not a religious person. I don't think of service in religious terms, but I think that 
sense of service is an important value for me and feels meaningful within my life. So I'm a chair of governors at the local school. I'm involved in putting on local community events. We had a good look at buying the local pub for the community, but that got bought by a millionaire instead. That was a shame. But I think that's, for me, that feels like it enriches my life and helps me feel connected to the people immediately around me in a way that I don't think I did feel quite as much when I lived in London. So, Matt, what have you done recently that's been meaningful? I celebrated a significant birthday and my wife and I went on the Camino de Santiago, which is a pilgrimage. And again, I should <laughs> immediately say like Graham, I'm not in the least bit religious, but there was something wonderful about that. We've got two young boys, as I mentioned earlier. It's quite nice to have some adult time away from them. We've got to a phase in life where we are looking back and sort of reflecting on a particular phase of parenting and family life and just those hours and hours on that walk, some of it beautiful, some of it not. I don't know, just something um, very freeing about that in contrast to busy family life, handing the baton back and forth on pickups and drop-offs and various other things. Just a bit of time for us, a bit of time for ourselves as well, just lost in music or uh, podcast. You're walking about eight, ten hours a day, so um, nice physical strain on the body as well. You sleep well. And the accommodation, you don't need to worry about that. There are just a few hostels or modest hotels in the towns that you stop when you do the, we only did the last leg of the walk, I should be honest. All of the decisions are taken away from you. You know, you just, you rock up and it's two star or three star accommodation, nothing fancy. You're not going to get a great meal, but you're going to get a nutritious, tasty meal and simple pleasures. How many days did you, did you walk for? Oh, I, I, I don't know when I want to confess this because then uh, <laughs> just, we just did the very last leg. So we were away for five days, which was, I think about the max we could do with our boys. So just that final bit, we took the photograph where you get to the cathedral at the end in the main square. So um, we, you we did the equivalent of getting the helicopter to the summit of Everest, didn't you? Pretty much thought, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty much. The other thing I love doing, if I can sneak one more thing in, is um, my boy plays in his class a thing called Silent Ball, which I think is a way that the teacher sort of manages the children when they've been doing a lot of act sort of uh, brain activity. So they do a little bit of physical activities, game of catch. And the rule is you have to throw underarm and you have to be completely silent during the game. And he loves it. And he's brought it home to our house. And when you're doing that, either as a family or with the two boys or with my older boy, who particularly enjoys the game, is something just so meditative. You're just in a flow state with those catches. It's a very simple activity. It doesn't really mean anything, but it's just, you know, it's, it's lovely and wonderful in a way that's hard to put into words. So thank you very much for being witnesses today. We're going to continue the conversation. What to do if you feel blocked in your therapy or having problems with your therapist? We'll be discussing all of that in a moment. And if you want to hear the bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.